Hi, Fermi Lab. I'm a scientist here at the lab. My name is Steve. Uh, and thank you all for coming out here in the snow. It's really great to see a big crowd here, even though there's all this worry about, you know, snowmageddon might happen again. Um, so this is a physics slam. What do you talk about at the physics slam? Uh, whatever you want, I think. So that's what I'm going to do. And maybe I think my motivation is because, I don't know, I've stared at too many schedules and spreadsheets and plots, or I keep hearing people say that physics is just a, a slog through math or something, or, or I sit at my desk sometimes and I go, why am I doing this? But so what I'm going to tell you about is why physics and particle physics and a slight bent toward collider physics is fun. You want to have fun? Yeah. You really want to have fun? Yeah. OK, so I'm going to tell you why. I'm going to try to convince you why it's fun. And already you can see from this picture, it looks like fun, doesn't it? So who knows about fun? Kids, right kids? Hey, I can't hear you, kids. Thank you. Kids know about fun. I've learned a lot, actually probably relearned a lot about fun from my kids. And one of the things that I learned is that building stuff is fun. If you have the right building blocks, Legos in this case, you can build almost everything, including Sacre Coeur, which happens to be at uh, Windsor, England, at Legoland. So we have building blocks in particle physics, too. But our building blocks are not Legos. They're the elementary particles. And you've seen this maybe a few times before. I'll try to run through it without getting too boring, because this is about fun, right? So this is, it's pretty simple, actually. You shouldn't be scared. There's only 12 things to remember here. It's not like chemistry. Chemistry has this periodic table with 108 things that you have to remember. We only have 12, right? And they come very organized. So there's three families, one, two, three. Each family has two pairs of things, pink things and green things. You can remember that, right? <laughs> so let's start with this first family here. This is a familiar family. It has the electron. Everybody knows about the electron. It drives all our electronics. And its sister, the neutrino, I'll tell you a little bit about neutrinos in a bit. Um, those are the leptons. And up here you have quarks. And two up quarks and a down quark make a proton. And two down quarks and one up quark make a neutron. And you make protons and neutrons and electrons. You put them together, you have atoms, you make molecules, you make everything we know about. So that's everything we know about. And then it just has two more families that are a bit heavier. It's pretty simple, actually. <coughs> so however, it's not just stuff. I should say there's also a whole family of antimatter where for each thing you have an anti thing. Also simple to remember. <laughs> but it's not just stuff you can have, you have to know how they interact. And that is, for instance, the difference between the pink things and the green things is the pink things interact in, with the strong force, which is carried by this gluon, represented by this gluon, and the green things do not. Similarly, there's the electromagnetic force. That talks to all the pink things because they're charged. These guys are minus two-thirds charge, and these guys are, sorry, plus two-thirds charge, minus one-third charge. And these leptons down here are charged as well. So they talk to the photon. And then there's one more force carrier, the, the weak, which is carried by the Z and W boson. And the odd thing here, so first of all, the Z and the W talk to everything, and that's where the neutrinos come in. And that's why neutrinos are both interesting, because they only talk to the weak force, and boring, because they only talk to the weak force. Um, <coughs> So anyway, the odd thing about the Z and the W is that these guys have mass, whereas the photon is massless and the gluon is massless. So there's some oddities here, but it's not that hard to remember. Um, how do we know all this stuff? Well, we've used accelerators, uh, just like Cindy just told you about, right? So thank you, Cindy, for all your work, because it's true. My whole research career depends upon her. So you should vote for her, maybe. Oh, I didn't say that. I didn't say that. <laughs> OK. OK, some findings using accelerators. So how do we know all this stuff? So we found out early in the 60s that the proton is made of three quarks, which was very interesting because we didn't even know there were quarks before that. <coughs> Later on, uh, at Brookhaven, we found out there were more than three quarks. That's important because as soon as, you have, uh, well, as soon as you have three or more, you can start making pairs, and you can start seeing this pattern emerge. <coughs> oh, I jumped twice. So. Uh, over in Switzerland, which I'm going to tell you a little bit more later, we learned a lot about the Z boson and the W boson, and we understand these massive force carriers and how they interact with all this stuff. More recently, both in Japan and out in California, we made uh, accelerators that focused on the bottom quark, and we learned a lot about antiparticles and not just particles in the mirror. Uh, and then recently, uh, we learned how these, these massive, these, these guys get their mass and how these guys get their mass too. We learned how mass enters the game uh, with this new discovery of new particle called a Higgs boson. Okay, so that's the stuff. What can you do the, with this stuff? So the first thing you can do is you can scribble. Scribbling is fun, right? Yeah, so you can make scribbles, but we make special scribbles. Our scribbles look kind of like this. 
right? So you got lines and you got squiggly things around here, and we can actually use them to calculate stuff. And so here, in fact, is the start of the calculation of this particular process where you just get a photon that scatters off a lepton, basically. And in fact, you can even consider this more scribbling. And if you scribble some more, actually a lot more, you'd scribble through 10 pages of stuff and, and you come up with the answer. And well, maybe that part's not so fun. Uh, but with this audience, maybe that part is fun. And if you think that's fun, we can talk about it later. The real fun part is that when you get done with the scribbling, you come up with an answer, and then you go off and you measure it. And you find out, so here is the result of, say, three dozen different types of scribbling. Uh, and then they compare it with the experiment. And what you see is that in almost every case, it's actually from my competitors to show you that uh, particle physics is bipartisan. Um, you see that they match really, really well all the way across the board. And this is 14 orders of magnitude. So that's like saying, I have the same tool that can measure accurately a centimeter or can measure from here to the center of the sun. Same accuracy, same tool. That's pretty amazing, pretty cool, pretty fun. OK, so how are these measurements made? You crash stuff together. Cindy already told you a little about this, but clearly, obviously, crashing stuff is fun too. So the accelerator that I'm going to tell you about is the Large Hadron Collider. It's a racetrack. Uh, out, it's 27 kilometers around. It's in uh, Geneva, Switzerland. It's very near Lac Le Mans here. I think people might have fun there, but I've never been there. And I certainly have never been out here to the Alps where I think people have fun too, I promise you. <laughs> All the fun is going on underground where you run p particles around in, in circles, uh, protons in this case going in both directions and colliding at these four points. Uh, it's a pretty cool machine. We do, initially we started out with a million events per second at 7 TeV, and then we doubled the energy, and we hope to get up to a billion per second. Uh, and very soon we're actually colliding not protons, but lead ions, which make that big splash on the first slide that I showed you. So this is the highest energy machine in the world. The beam stores as much energy as 700 megajoules, which is like two battleship guns going off at the same time. Uh, that's big crashes, right? Kind of fun, too. How, you might ask, do we control such things? We use magnets, right? And in fact, this is also fun. Everybody, well, of a certain age probably did this to their own particle accelerator. Everybody had a particle accelerator in your home, right? We called it a CRT, or you called it a TV. But it's a particle accelerator, and if you took a magnet up to your particle accelerator, you could get the distortion of the, of the signature, of the, of the picture, and then you have to find the degaussing button and fix it. Do you know what a degaussing button is? Google it, you'll find out. <laughs> okay, so uh, our, uh, our magnets are this, all here, just a picture of them, 27 kilometers around to guide the particles around the collider. Finally, you need tools for looking for the cool stuff. You're colliding things, but you gotta look and see what's coming out, and so you need some cool tools. Our tool, what is a detector? What, what are we kind of looking at? We're looking at basically Tim the Beaver, but we're looking at Tim the Beaver in many different ways and seeing how much redness is in Tim the Beaver and how much purpleness and blueness. You can start to think of the particle detectors the same way. It's measuring the different kinds of content in the same event. Ours is kind of fast. It's a 100 megapixel camera, if you think about it that way, with a 40 megahertz shutter speed. So it's giving you like something like a two terabit a second of data. So that's kind of like a hard disk every couple of seconds. So you know, you have your hard disk at home, you fill it. Three seconds later, you get the another one, you put it in, you fill it. Three seconds later, you get another one, you fill it, and you keep going like that. So here's just a, I'm going to be quick here because I'm running out of time. Here's how, you, how it works for different kinds of particles, which are represented by different colors here. You get a different signature. So this red particle, which is an electron, curves in this middle part of the detector and then leaves a splotch of energy in the next layer. And this blue particle, a muon, also curves slightly less because it's higher energy. But it makes it all the way out here and then leaves the signature out here. And even neutrinos, they don't interact. I remember, they don't interact with anything. So they just go straight through without leaving any signatures. Uh, this is the CMS detector, and it's only a little slice of it. The magnetic field here is 3.8 Tesla, so that's 40,000 40, times Earth, so it's super strong magnetic field. The DAQ, the way you read this whole thing out, brings these 10 to the 9 events per second down to something like 100 or maybe 1,000 events per second, so it's super fast. And its weight is 14.5 kilotons, diameter is 15 meters, so that's actually about 10 feet longer than the size of this. If you tried to put the thing in this building, it would not fit. It would stick out in about the fifth row, and it probably wouldn't come, I don't think it'd fit underneath the ceiling. It's huge. So the cool thing about this toy is there's some assembly required. So 
you have to put it together yourself. You start with things like this. This is a silicon wafer. It's about the size of my hand. You put that in what's called a rod. You put six of them together. And you make something that's about a meter long. You put that in a detector like this. Oh, no. I'm out of time. All right, I'm going to skip to my last slide. Why is it really fun? It's because we get to explore the universe. We get to wonder about how things really work. And that is really the biggest puzzle of them all. Thank you.